Welcome back to Critic Proof. I'm your host, Alyssa Rosenberg, the features editor at Think Progress and the television columnist for women in Hollywood. And I am joined today by one of my new favorite people to talk to, uh, Daily Caller blogger and week columnist for the week, uh, Matt Lewis. And we're here to talk uh, two of the most miserable events of the last month in past co- pop culture, the renewal of the sexual abuse allegations against Woody Allen and the death of Philip Seymour Hoffman. Cheery! <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> I wanted to start by talking about Woody Allen, since you published a piece that I specifically want to argue about a little bit. Um, and your argument has been, you know, and correct me if I'm summarizing you wrong here, but your argument was that Woody Allen and the sort of sexual abuse charges against him are, um, and the fact that a lot of liberals are, who have enjoyed his movies are struggling with them now, um are sort of an opportunity for liberals to rethink some of our cultural permissiveness. And is that is that in the ballpark? Is that fair? Yeah, it's, it's definitely in the ballpark. Um, I think that basically, you know, I, the concern that cultural conservatives ha- have is that they've been lamenting uh, a lot of the what Hollywood and entertainment has put out in terms of worldview messages – for many, many years. And, you know, in the time, if you criticized Annie Hall in in the 70s, you would have been considered a rube. And then many years later, though, we start to see more, you know, kind of secular liberals begin to look back and say, oh, well, you know what? Murphy Brown was actually wrong. Um, And so that's the point that I was making is that it does seem, and I've seen some some sort of thought pieces in places like Esquire where, People are finally, uh, in the mainstream media, finally coming around to say, hey, maybe some of this stuff in these movies was a little bit weird after all. Sure. I mean, I I agree with you that there have been sort of some reevaluations, and I think that one of the things that's been very interesting about this round of conversation about Alan, because, of course, these allegations are 22 years old, um, has been, you know, that the traditional call to separate the art from the artist doesn't really exonerate the art in this case, and I think that's true. But I want to push back on the idea that Allen's values, especially in his sort of serious romantic comedies like Manhattan and Annie Hall, are necessarily liberal permissive values. Um, And I also think we should talk a little bit about, you know, whether they were criticized at the time or not. Um, Because it seems to me that Allen comes less out of a, you know, particularly sexual liberation worldview or, you know, any sort of particular liberal politics than from sort of theories of self-actualization that were very popular when his movies were made, that you were supposed to sort of plumb your own neuroses and that the most important thing to get over was the sort of internal repression that you'd built up about your own desires, your own abilities. And I think this is less a political framework than a sort of very culturally specific, you know, New York psychoanalytic um, way of looking at things. I don't know that, I mean, and I think it's important to look at that as a, you know, as a very specific place that Alan's work is coming from. And his work is in, is interesting because it's specific, but I don't know that that necessarily makes it liberal. Right. Well, look, I, I would agree. Most It's mostly not overtly political. Um, there is that line in Annie Hall where he talks about William F. Buckley and National Review sort of takes a jab at, at Buckley. <clears throat> but generally, I do agree it's not like overtly political. Mm. Um, but but I also think that it was sort of almost like an, an, an iconic example of what I would sort of cosmopolitan secular liberalism and contrasted with cultural conservatism. And it's about sexual mores and uh, and all sorts of things, which are really more worldview. It's not really right versus left, Republican versus Democrat. Sure. I think it's a sort of it's a conservative worldview that's very traditional family values versus the worldview that Alan was putting forth, which I think, um, generally speaking, my impression has been that most of the mainstream media elites. We're very much applauding that um, as, as, you know, uh, being a positive force. Um, Whereas I think a lot of cultural conservatives at the time were really kind of disturbed by 
uh, Alan's movies. Um, it certainly didn't resonate with them. So I, I think that this was a real, like, a, two, a sort of a two Americas example, how, how you felt about Woody Allen in circa 1979. Mm. Well, I mean, I think that, <clears throat> I mean, I think that you're true. It's, it's true that Allen comes out of this sort of educated, urban, urbane um, perspective, but it's also very male, right? I mean, the vision of, you know, a Diane Keaton in every Woody Allen's bed <laughs> you know, very much a, you know, a, a kind of male fantasy that we, I think, see today. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, you know, the theory of sexual poverty. Is this something that you've heard about at all? It's sort of crawled I mean, it up. May have come up in, it may have come up in one of my classes in Shepherd, Shepherd College, West Virginia, but <laughs> I'm not an expert on it. <clears throat> so it's an idea that sort of crawled up out of the men's rights advocacy movement, which... Um, is that, you know, men are entitled to sex and sexual contact. And, you know, I think that's something that shows up a lot in Woody Allen movies, right? I mean, the idea that, you know, you too can be, you know, a neurotic nebbish who pays very little attention to other people's feelings and still feel sort of wronged when your gorgeous girlfriend goes off and does something else. When your 17-year-old girlfriend moves to London to pursue her artistic career, which is what happens at the end of Manhattan. You know, I mean, and so I think that in as much as Woody Allen represents any sort of sexual liberation ideal, it's one that belongs more to men than to women. It doesn't, I'm, right. I guess I'd suggest... Well, I, I, I agree, but I, no, I totally agree with you. Sure. And, and I would argue, though, at the time... This is sort of an indictment on second wave feminism, as far as I'm concerned. I, there may have been a couple of, of people hitting Woody Allen from the left, arguing that he was a misogynist. But by and large, I would say that that uh, polite company and the the intelligentsia circled the wagons around him back then, and essentially Except, said. I, don't know that, I mean, I don't know that that's true at all. In 1979, Joan Didion is writing in the New York Review of Books. You know, just making fun of Alan, <laughs> you know. Well, I love, jo I, I consider Joan Didion a conservative, personally. Uh, so I love, I'm a huge J. Diddy fan myself, and uh, a big fan of, of coming of, uh, or slouching toward Bethlehem, and uh, she, I will say this, um, I, I would say uh, she she may be the exception that proves the rule, because she was the one who pointed out, you know, the, the overreach of uh, the 60s counterculture in, in San Francisco, Hate ashbury so I think she's a, I think I would say that Didion is an especially courageous uh, essayist who was willing to call out possibly what was her own side. Um, but I would say she may be the exception. But it, my point is that I think there is sort of a double standard where, like, if you're Andrew Dice Clay, you are fair to attack and call a misogynist. If you're Hugh Hefner, then you're a... Uh, First Amendment rights advocate. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, like there's I mean, one, there are, one man's creep is another man's, you know, it's, I think there is a double standard. Well, I also think that, you know, Hugh Hefner, for all that, you know, his magazine may not be my preferred reading material, has made substantial financial contributions to liberal causes. I mean, he's put his money where at least some of his mouth is. Um, and, you know, and his daughter Christy has done the same thing. And so I think that, you know, there are, there are allies who are complicated allies. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think Woody Allen fits into that rubric, though, is what I would say. Is I, I think that, that Woody Allen is sort of similar to Hugh Hefner in the sense that, you know, <clears throat> it's, like when, it's like when Republicans are okay with, like, right-wing dictators. You know, it's, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch kind of thing. I think it's more complicated than that. I mean, I guess <laughs> okay. I just, you know, I, I think maybe some of the problem here is that I don't really see Woody Allen as fitting into a two Americas framework, right? I mean, he, to a certain extent, represents the way in which America is vastly more atomized. And so, you know, he's one of a number of visions of sexual liberation. He's one of a number of visions of masculinity. Um... But to, I mean, I think to suggest that there is, you know, 
that Woody Allen represents the liberal consensus is perhaps a bridge too far. Well, I'll give you, um, I guess I have two, two quick thoughts. Um, one is anecdotal. So I can remember like when I was a little kid, my mom would hear about, you know, Woody Allen Mm. and like one of, like rent one of his movies on, you know, VHS videotape or something. And she would always quit watching like halfway through being really appalled by the values. Um, I was just watching, rewatching the, uh, in preparation for this, rewatching the PBS documentary Mm -hmm. on Woody Allen. And they have a clip uh, from one of his movies where I forget which one, I don't think it was in Annie Hall or or Manhattan, but it, it was like that same era. Um, when Woody Allen, I guess, is, gets divorced or, or his girlfriend leaves him and his friend is like, this is a great opportunity for you to have sex with women of all different, you know, races, creeds and colors. And, you know, and like now nowadays that may not seem that astounding, but for my sort of middle America mom, like that sort of just those values alone um, being promoted by Hollywood were enough for her to like stop the VCR. Um, and the fact that like that may be a somewhat unique experience, I think is indicative of, of the divide. Like there were, um, I, I really think like uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a sort of Rorschach test, you know, mm. almost of red America versus blue America, how you felt about him uh, in 1979. That, that's entirely possible, and I wasn't born in 1979, so I <laughs> I cannot travel through time and pretend that you know I uh, I was I you know I can't pretend that I was there. To me, Woody Allen is kind of an interesting you know Rorschach test, not really for red or blue America, but how you know conversations about sexual liberation and sexual satisfaction uh, have changed over time, right? I mean, I think it might. You know, when Woody Allen is making Manhattan and Interiors and Annie Hall and Hannah and her sisters, you know, the idea that a guy who looks like Woody Allen could be a good lover, could get laid on a regular basis, could, you know, attract these intellectual attractive women might have been sort of a necessary pushback against an ideal. But I also think that it's a, you know, it's a vision of relationships that hasn't aged particularly attractively. Um, You know, I think that, I mean... Manhattan, you know, Diane Keaton's character in Manhattan is fascinating and intellectual and allowed to be, you know, simultaneously very smart and sort of indecisive about her personal life in a way that I think stands up really well today. That said, Alan's character in that movie, you know, a who wants to be a serious writer, he has this contempt for television, you know, uh, is in this sort of back and forth relationship with the 17 year old. I mean, just looks insane today by any number of measures, right? I mean, we live in an environment where television writing is esteemed. (laughs) We live in an environment where it's creepy for a 42-year-old to date a 17-year-old. And so for me, you know, Alan, Alan's sort of sexual values have stayed very similar and the culture around him has changed a lot. And, you know, I think for good and for ill. Um, I think, you know, I do you think that female characters in Hollywood as a whole have gotten flatter and less complex in a lot of ways? And that's really unfortunate. Um, and at the same time, I think we've come to recognize that, you know, sort of sexual liberation allowed some, for some really predatory behaviors. And, you know, that's a... Right. I mean, I don't well, know I, that... I don't know that well, that's I think, necessarily... I, think I don't. That, I just Can I just say one quick thing? I'm I, sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I think that... <laughs> You know, given that, you know, feminism comes out of some of the sort of dismissive and sexually entitled or second wave feminism, um, as it's sort of commonly historically defined, comes out of female dissatisfaction with, you know, among other things, sexual entitlement by men in left movements, you know, and that tension has sort of always been there. And in some ways, a lot of the rest of the world has caught up with, you know, with Feminists who weren't happy with being sexual rewards <laughs> or sexual adjuncts to larger movements. So, so I think a, a few things there. One, one point about Woody Allen that hasn't been made much lately is <clears throat> the mainstreaming of nerd culture, um, and you touched yeah. on it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but but I think for you know now now it's 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 not surprising that that 
you know, Ezra Klein can be considered a sex symbol. Um, I have to no comment that one. Ezra and I are friends. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, it's not just him. I mean, there's a whole, without naming too many names, I mean, it's like the big, you know, I want to do like a big bang theory of political bloggers. (laughs) And it's, it's, it's totally a, you know, it's a thing. And the fact that they can get laid and become like, you know, popular um, is a prime example of how the world has changed. And I think Woody Allen may be their pioneer in a sense. The first guy who like, you know, brought about the the glasses and the whole that, that you can sort of be like this neurotic guy and, and that that will help you, you know, uh, pick up chicks and whatnot. Well, I also think um, neuros- neuroses has been decoupled from sort of intellectual interests, right? I mean, I think you can be... You know, you can be a wonk and not be seeing three different psychoanalysts. <laughs> there is that, yeah. There is that. I mean, part of it was the nerdy thing. Part of it was the wonky thing. Um, I also think that there is the other thing where, um, where like, sexual liberation um, and feminine, not feminism exactly, but I would say sexual liberation, you know, the sort of libertine thing, um, nobody has made off better than men yeah. in a sense for this, right? So, like, it's ostensibly about um, empowering women. But if you're a guy who really wants to, you know, get with a lot of women, this is a godsend for you. All yeah, you have to say I, is, I like, why are you really, so uptight? Let's, you know. <laughs> and I don't think anyone would argue with the fact that, you know, male support provisions of female sexual liberation have often been deeply self-interested. You know, I don't think anyone would argue with that. Absolutely. The other point that I would make is going, going full circle back to, uh, to where we started with this about where I see, um, the sort of mainstream elite media finally getting around to admitting that Dan Quayle was right with Murphy Brown. And by the way, when I say that I'm, this is, I have three solid examples in the Atlantic, uh, and I think New York Magazine, and in the Washington Post, where three different writers wrote that piece in the past year, oh my God. Um, oh my God. which would have been absurd in 1992 for anybody to take Dan Quayle's side of the Murphy Brown thing. Um, and so I, I, I suspect that what happened is Ronan Farrow, right? So my take is that <clears throat> if Woody Allen didn't have a famous wife and famous kids that um, he would have basically been Roman Polanski, which, which is to say, no matter what everybody else thought about him, the Hollywood folk would have stuck with him. I think the problem for Woody Allen is that Ronan Farrow has been somehow, um, you know, granted this TV show. And to me, it seems like a complete non sequitur. Like, it's not like Alex Wagner, who like, started appearing on MSNBC a lot and sort of did really well and, and got got a show. Mm. I have no idea where Ronan Farrow came from, but it's bad news for Woody Allen that he is now the toast of the town. And I think that that is a big story. If Ronan Farrow wasn't sort of uh, the, new, the new it kid, then I don't think Woody Allen would be in as much trouble as he's in. <sighs> okay, there from a, a lot PR, of... PR standpoint. Yeah, there are a lot of ideas there to unpack, um, and I want to start with sort of the the Murphy, you know, Murphy Brown is bad role model idea. Um, I mean, I think that you know the issues are a lot more nuanced than that, right? I mean, I don't know that we're seeing, in you know, an actually demographically, I don't I don't know that we're seeing a demographic explosion of single women who are choosing to have kids on their own, especially who can't afford it. I mean, I don't think. I don't think most people set out as their plan to become single parents. Um, and I think in as much that, you know, folks on the left have recognized that marriage is correlated with better economic outcomes. Um, it's, you know, I think folks still recognize that it's very difficult to reverse engineer good marriages, uh, you know, as a, you know, as a cure for uh, single parenthood uh, in so much as, you know, you can call it that. Um, I mean, I think there are, you know, there are situations where it doesn't make sense for women to get married for, simply for the sake of getting married, especially if that produces, you know, more unstable environments for their kids, if it risks incurring 
you know, huge, you know, hugely adverse economic outcomes if a marriage doesn't work out. Um, And so I think that, you know, in so much as liberals have sort of entered the debate over marriage, it's with, you know, it's with some more nuanced thinking about, about policy outcomes um, and, you know, sort of how to, you know, the extent to which a panacea can actually be engineered. Um, so I, I want to I want to be clear about that. I thought Annie Lowry's piece in the Times um, about the sort of challenges of marriage promotion as a policy um, was really quite good. Um, sort of on the second issue, I want to be really careful because I don't. I think it's very very dangerous to start talking about Ronan Farrow's MSNBC show and these allegations because I, I mean I do not think we should say that these allegations have been renewed to promote the show or anything yeah. else. I mean, I think like that, that is a line of inquiry that I think is. Yeah, really no, I, I agree. And, and, I, and I'm not, and I, just, I know some people have suggested that no. I have not. I'm saying, I don't know that the allegations would be getting as much attention if he weren't now. I think that, I think that's true. And I think, you know, this is actually to me, not the way that you would want ideally to launch a cable news show. And so to me, there's actually something sort of remarkable about Ronan using a moment that could be about sort of purely furthering his own career. Right. Cause I don't, I mean, this is a no win scenario for anyone. Right. I mean, you know, depending on where the, you know, the alleged abuse of Dylan Farrow is supposed to have taken place, the statute of limitations is up. You know, this is never going to be adjudic- adjudicated by a court of law. It can only be miserable and messy. And now that, you know, Woody is trotting out Moses Farrow um, to, you know, sort of speak for his side. And this can only be destructive and miserable and take away from Ronan's career. And so the fact that he's standing up for his sister is actually, you know, to me, pretty admirable considering how infrequent it is to see sexual abuse and sexual assault victim siblings, you know, getting public spotlights to talk about, you know, their support for their siblings and the impact that it has on them too. So, as long as we're cool, as long as we're clear on yeah, that, yeah. it was just, I wanted to be, I wanted to be very careful yeah, there. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's an interesting moment. And, um, I mean, this, you know, this didn't stop Woody Allen in the past. It's not as, you know, and I think the Atlantic had a really striking piece about why, um, child sex abuse victims narratives are often sort of incoherent or come across as staged. Um, and one of the things I thought was striking about that piece is that I think we're seeing in the Allen debate is a sense that these issues are private, you know, that their family matters or not, you know, matters of public concern. And I think that's protect, I think that's protected Woody Allen for a long time. Well, the, you know? the one thing, the, the one thing though, is that I, I do think that, that critics and cultural commentators have a a responsibility to, um, you know, talk about the impact that work has on the culture. And, and as, as we said, you know, it's, it's dangerous to assign uh, a character's comments or actions to, uh, to the writer. But in the case of Alan, it's very clear that um, much of his work was really biographical or, or at least, um, uh, you know, autobiographical or, or at least, uh, yeah. you know, was something that represented to some extent his, his views, his feelings. Um, so this, this Esquire piece that, that was out a couple of days ago, um, where they essentially were like reevaluating Woody Allen's work. And I do want to go back to, you mentioned Manhattan where Woody Allen yeah. plays a character who was 42 years old who was um, dating a 17-year-old played by Mariel Hemingway. Based on a real relationship Woody <laughs> Allen had with a high school student. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about the movie is that you could do a movie where that happens, but you would expect the other characters to find it problematic. or, or Instead of sort of having that high-fiving attitude towards right. it that they have in the movie. Yeah, it's And gross. that's the thing that's really concerning about it is that there is no sense that anybody in the movie thinks there's any problem with it whatsoever. And my sense is that the critics and the culture basically uh, received it with a yawn, that, that there wasn't 
uh, any sort of outrage, that it was like Woody being Woody. And I think that says, I, mean, I, think, I think that says something about the, uh, you know, the sort of Pauline Kales of that era, you know, uh, which would be Pauline Kale, that, that they didn't, that they mean, didn't talk about the, the problematic part of that. Yeah, well, let's see. I mean, I don't actually know what Pauline Kale wrote about Manhattan, so let's see if we can find it. Hmm. Looks like... Is this a trap you're setting for me, or are you actually looking for it? <laughs> um, well, apparently she wrote at the time, What man in his 40s but Woody Allen, Pauline Kale asked, could pass off a predilection for teenagers as a quest for true values? <laughs> so it does seem like, the, you know... I, just to exonerate Polly and Kale, it does seem like she uh, she was skeptical at the skeptical, time. Skeptical, but um, I mean, I, I would think that that it, that it could have been met with I a mean, lot, a lot was, more condemnation or, or questioning. I mean, I think you know, I think it's easy to lob that, and we'd probably have to do a literature review. I'm happy to I'm happy to go back <laughs> and do some research, and I think, but I think that's a I, I don't know that that's a charge supported by the actual sort of Rotten Tomatoes of the day. I think we'd have to go back and take a look at that. Yeah. Um, you know, I but I do think, I mean, for me, you know, I've, I grew up in Woody Allen's prose, which I think is, like, his humor pieces are really, really funny. Um, part of the reason it drives me nuts that Midnight in Paris, um, you know, won for best original screenplay is that it's based on two extremely superior Woody Allen short stories, uh, one Paris in the twenties, which is sort of a pastiche of Hemingway and, um, you know, Gertrude Stein and everything else. And then another short story where a character, uh, pays a magician to send him into Madame Bovary and brings her back to New York only to get tired of her. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he has her sent back into the book and then comes back to the musician, the magician and asked to be sent into another novel, but ends up in a Spanish textbook by mistake. Um, you know, those stories are really funny and really perceptive about men. Um, and I think that was a more yeah, positive, I mean, I, like, op- that, that that film is is a pretty positive, optimistic, um, fun uh, film, as opposed to some of his other stuff, which seems kind of nihilistic. So it, is a, it is interesting he could right. do, he wasn't just uh, sort of dark, either. He also had that other side to him, yeah. has that other side to him. Sure. And I guess, so the other thing I would say about, you know, to me, separating the art from the artist doesn't actually remove what bothers me about Woody Allen's movies. Um, You know, and I think that we can set all of this aside. Like, Woody Allen could be a family man who lived in the suburbs, who had, like, had, you know, waited until he got married to have sex and, like, never strayed from his vows and loves his kids – And the movies would still be really weird, you know? I mean, the attitudes about men and women and relationships and sex and sexual entitlement would still be uncomfortable. And I think that, you know, it's interesting for me that people are talking about, you know, revisiting Alan's work or seeing it in a new light, because it seems to me, you know, this has always been there. And, you know, as I was sort of speaking about Alan as as a good test case for how values have changed, you know, maybe in the seventies they were a better fit, but you know, if, if you look at Alan's movies with, I think the values, or at least some of the values that you and I share now, it's not as if those movie, if the, it's not as if those values suddenly became creepy or suddenly became anxiety provoking because of the allegations. I mean, the text is the text. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, which which is part of my argument, which is that it's interesting now that because of the allegations, people are going back and revisiting and, and looking with a more skeptical eye toward his oeuvre. Um, whereas yeah. they weren't doing. I mean, it's not like his, it's not like he's inconsequential. I mean, he is uh, incredibly important. I mean, even currently uh, with Blue Jasmine. Yeah. I mean, he, he's currently very relevant and. Um, but really nobody was talking about the impact that he had uh, in, in terms of the culture and society um, until this, until these allegations happen. And I think that's a little bit problematic. No. Sure. No, I think it's a, I think it's telling. I think people have wanted to be comfortable with Woody Allen for a long time. And, you know, 
I I mean, I feel terrible for Dylan Farrow that I think she's stuck without a legal resolution. That's yeah. that's an awful situation, but you know, purely in the cause of sort of engaged movie viewing, you know, maybe it's a good thing that people are rewatching the movies that they haven't thought about as closely as they might. Oh, yeah, I you know, totally that's agree. A, yeah, this could be, I mean, a, a, could be an opportunity for people to, uh, you know, we're having this, com- we're having the conversation now, so that, yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, to switch to a more depressing topic, <laughs> maybe not a more depressing topic, um, I don't, I don't know how you felt last weekend, but I was, I was out for a walk, I was having lunch, and my boyfriend told me that Philip Seymour Hoffman had died, and I just started shaking. Um, I, and I had not expected that reaction, in part because I, I didn't expect Philip Seymour Hoffman to die when he was 46. Um, but it was, I was hit incredibly hard by his death. Um, uh, and I, I assume you were as well. It's just, it's so sad. It's so sad. Yeah. It's sad for all of us, not just him. I mean, and I I mean, I'm one of the people who believes he was probably the greatest actor of our, of our generation, of our time. Um, And he never, his, his, he never traded on looks or youth. So there's no, there's no reason Mm -hmm. to doubt that he couldn't have been, making great movies for 30 or 40 years. And in a world yeah. where there's so much mediocrity and so much, you know, people phoning it in, to lose one, to lose someone like him uh, is, is devastating. Yeah. No, I mean, it's... Yeah, and I think, in, in a weird way, you know, I think Hoffman's work is a contrast to so much of Allen's work in a lot of ways. I mean, so many Woody Allen's movies are based on sort of glamorizing neuroses or, you know, setting Allen up as a plausible figure of sexual desire. And so much of, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman's work and what made it great is being comfortable residing in ugly emotions or people who, you know, ugly interpretations of important people. And, you know, there was just this, utter lack of vanity in that work. And it's, you know, it's so revealing so much of the time, sometimes in really, you know, his portrait of Truman Capote is just acid. And yet I think really beautifully acted and with a lot of sympathy for the things that deserve the acid treatment. Um, You know, I mean, in the master, he is a, you know, he's a narcissistic fraudulent creator of a new religion (laughs) And he's one of the most sympathetic people in the movie. <laughs> as as a uh, as a creator of a religion would probably be in a sort of demagogic way, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a you got to have a lot of faith in yourself <laughs> to get people to believe in you. There has to be something charming in there. There are two things about Hoffman that I really liked. One is I think he was a consummate professional. I mean, who, whatever you do, if you're a writer. Uh, if you're a plumber, whatever it is, you know, you can learn something from the greats. And I think he was a true yeah. uh, craftsman at, at his at his trade, at, at his craft. I mean, he was a, a consummate professional. Um, I also think there's something almost intangible that, you know, Johnny, I don't know why I think of Johnny Cash, but Johnny Cash had this thing where whether you like country or rock or rap, you still respected Johnny Cash because you knew Johnny Cash yeah. was sincere and he would put it out there. It, it was his songs were like his heart was there right in front of you. Utter sincerity, no yeah. bullshit, just there. And I think that that Hoffman had that honesty. And so no matter what kind of music you like, what, no matter what kind of movies you like, uh, you just can't not like Philip Seymour Hoffman. Mm, yeah, no, and I think that, you know, it's, he played a lot of characters who, you know, were hiding behind vanity and pretension or using power to hurt other people or, you know, who were, you know, unable to hide their most difficult, humiliating emotions. And I think that, you know, that... 
we don't have a lot of that kind of honesty in our entertainment. I mean, we have ant- sort of mythologized anti-heroes. We have, you know, sort of been glorious bad men. But we don't have a lot of people who, we don't have a lot of depictions of people that are comfortable, you know, just with failure and frailty. Right. And, and I would say as a contrast. You know, that, that's a morally, that's a morally significant thing. Absolutely. And I would say as a contrast to Alan, I mean, because it's an obvious point for us to make. We just got talk, done talking about Woody Allen. I mean, obviously, no. Hoffman didn't write uh, the movies that he starred in. But he's a consummate professional. Yeah. He became the character. And I think he didn't necessarily glamorize his characters either. I mean, you know, in some cases yeah. he did, but in some cases uh, he didn't. And so, um, you know, I'm sure that there's going to be a temptation for some of the commenters to uh, to try to point out the similarities between the two and maybe my selective judgment of, of one of them and my praise of the other. But I do think they're quite, quite different. Yeah, no, absolutely true. And I do like Woody um, Allen movies, too. I mean, that's the other thing, even though I'm critical yeah. of some of the world view, you got to, you know, Annie Hall is a very, very good movie. There's no doubt about that. Right, well, everyone wishes they wrote the introduction to Manhattan, right? <laughs> and, the, and the cityscapes <laughs> great... are beautiful, the black and white. Yeah, I mean, there's some great yeah. things about it. I mean, artistically speaking, aesthetically speaking, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and, you know... The things that make me, you know, yeah, no, I mean, I think that Woody Allen's movies, you know, I think that some of the failures of value, values are to me sort of failures of craft, you know, they are, um, there's a sort of self-absorption that can take up some of the movies and flatten them out a little bit. Um, I mean, one thing that's been interesting to me about Hoffman's death, though, and that I found sort of difficult to deal with is, um, you know, the, I mean, the way he died is incredibly sad. I mean, nobody, you know, the idea of a talent, a talented actor dying from an injectable heroin overdose, the idea of anyone dying from an injectable heroin overdose is something that is, you know, seen as hugely undignified and sad. Um, and I was really appalled by the time, the New York Times piece on Hoffman's last days, um, not least because there were people in Narcotics Anonymous talking about his participation in the program, which is against the rules of the program, even after someone has died. Um, and just seems like huge sort of betrayal of trust and decency and dignity. And, you know, the the level of detail, um, you know, he has young kids. And I'm not, again, you know, I I'm a journalist. I believe in reporting. I think being unflinching is important. But there are there has just seemed something really prurient and ugly about what we think we need to know in this case. And, you know, what people think it's useful to reveal. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, that's a sort of an indictment on uh, new media culture and, and uh, the tabloidization of, of journalism. And the whole thing is, if you don't do it, someone else will. Um, and that sort of yeah. becomes an ends justifies the means, slippery slope kind of thing. But... Uh, yeah, it is unfortunate. Um, I mean, from my standpoint, and I, the, the thing that, the thing that sort of bothered me a little bit was, um, there were cultural conservatives who wanted to use this as an occasion, uh, to talk about Hollywood. And here I, it's sort of like a Woody Allen thing, uh, once the thing goes full circle, mm. but to, to use this as, as an example, uh, of, of Hollywood's values, uh, of how you give these people money, but they don't necessarily have uh, the values to sustain it and the drug culture. And um, I'm not opposed to having that discussion, but I felt like um, it was a little bit of a stretch with Hoffman. And I also think it's the kind of thing that you maybe want to wait a few days before uh, it's right. Well, I also just think, I think it's a stretch with heroin. Like, Nobody injects heroin because it's fun and glamorous, right. right? You inject heroin because you have a disease. <laughs> yeah, that, that and, was my, I you mean, know. my first impulse wasn't, oh, this is like some rich Hollywood elitist that, that you know, uh, my, my was, well, this is a guy who clearly had a problem and, and demons, you know, and, and it's, and that's, that's unfortunate. You know, and it's not, 
it's not as if, you know, I mean, I don't think addiction is a failure of values. I think it's a disease that people have. And I guess to me, the, you know, the part of the story that is sickening isn't, you know, rich actor overdoses, God, how privileged and, you know, careless and decadent he must have been. But that, you know, bad heroin killed more than 20 people on the East Coast the week that Philip Seymour Hoffman died. And after Philip Seymour Hoffman died, we got very high profile announcements of heroin trafficking or trafficking arrests, right? I mean, maybe those were in response to an ongoing investigation, but, you know, <laughs> the idea that, I mean, it, it actually makes me sadder to think that, you know, maybe we only care about protecting addicts when a famous one dies. Right. You know. Well, this also, I think, brings up an interesting question, which is the connection between um, brilliance and art and drugs and alcohol. Um, anybody who's a writer sort of knows, you know, the, whether it's Hemingway or whomever, um, there, there is the, some say, canard that, uh, that alcohol can, like, enhance, make you more creative, enhance your writing. And I do wonder about, um, you know, if there's any sort of correlate, I think there, there clearly is a correlation between like high intelligence and propensity to, to, to addiction. I mean, I, I think that's, I don't think I'm speaking out of school there with saying that, you know, I'm not suggesting that drugs made Philip Seymour Hoffman a better actor, but you do wonder about like what kind of, you know, for someone to be such a good actor and so good at, uh, at connecting to their emotion, um, well, I mean, but I think you can say that of any experience, right? I mean, any significant emotional experience, whether it's recovery, whether it's an amazing trip, whether it's having a child, you know, if you have more experiences to draw on, you know, that those are resources that you have as an actor. I, you know, I don't think that anyone, I don't think any, I mean, I think we're at a point in the cultural history of heroin in particular where the mythos around it has really dissipated. You know, I think, I mean, I don't think at this point anyone, I don't think anyone is shooting heroin because they don't know that it can kill you and destroy your instrument. You know, I, uh, I don't think that's anyone, I don't think that's why anyone at this point right. gets into heroin in the first place. I agree. I guess my question is like, would a entirely well-adjusted, sober Philip Seymour Hoffman been a great actor? I don't, I, I don't mean, know. you know, he was, he was 23 years sober and he was pretty great for a lot of those 23 years. That's true. That's true. So good that people don't even know it was him, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I didn't even realize he was in, that he, that that was him in Scent of a Woman until like five years ago, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, so he was so good, I think, that it, it was so good that he didn't sometimes until uh, retroactively get credit for some of his really good performances, you know? Yeah, it's a, you know, I just, I wrote at the time and I just feel, you know, it's it's one thing when someone young and promising dies. And it's another thing when someone dies at the height of their powers, because you've just, there's no, it's not speculation. You know what you've right. lost. And I just, I feel that about him so powerfully. Absolutely. I mean. So I was wondering, like, who who are going to be, I mean, obviously they're old, older actors like De Niro. Um, but in terms of, mm -hmm. like, the next generation or, 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 or Hoffman's generation, um, who who are the actors who could fill that space? And, and I'll, I'll give you, I have I have four. Um, and I'd love to get your take on them. One, one of them, I think. To use an upworthy title, one of them will surprise you. Um, yeah. So Daniel Day Lewis won't surprise you. Uh, yeah. Joaquin Phoenix won't surprise you. Um, yeah. I think Paul Giamatti might surprise you. Yeah, I love Giamatti. The, I mean, I think he's great. The one you know, that I, th I think. Well, that the one that I think would surprise you is uh, John C. Riley. I think he has the potential because uh, you know. Hoffman did comedies like you know Long Came Polly, yeah. And I think that John C. Riley is un is an undervalued commodity in the acting world. Yeah, 
no, I think that's, I mean, I agree with that. Um, you know, he both, you know, he's done serious and interesting dramatic work. I also think that, so Giamatti to me tends to use comedy as a bit of a shield, well, I th where I think that Riley often um, uses it to sort of self-deprecate and expose. Um, this will be a surprising movie to bring up in this conversation, but I think he is so, so great in Talladega Nights. Um, <laughs> which is not a movie that I... That just happened. Is... <laughs> <laughs> I mean... And that's like a big, broad, silly movie that has has grown on me a it's lot since I first saw it. It's also it's also one of the first illustrations we have of the greatness of Amy Adams, and for that alone should be recognized. But you know, as the sort of backup to you know this famous race car driver who's always been a number two, and who sort of just covets all the things that you know Ricky Bobby, this driver ahead of him, has. You know, he really punctures. You know, both he and Farrell, but I think John C. Riley in a much more sort of vulnerable mm -hmm. way, really sort of puncture what men are supposed to aspire to, you know, and sort of consumer culture and everything else. I mean, it's incredibly like it's a very precise performance. So I am. Yes, I I, I am the person who is using Talladega Nights <laughs> to advance your theory about the greatness of John yeah. C. Riley. Well, just remember, <laughs> if you ain't first, you're last. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Also, Jane Lynch, you know. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'd forgotten. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. I mean, that movie is extremely well cast, top to bottom. And it's one of, you know, Sacha Baron Cohen is very good, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think I think that's a good cast of actors that you're pulling out. Um, it's very interesting, I think, actors in their 20s and 30s right now. I think we actually have a very weak cast uh, or a weak overall collection of young male actors and a much stronger and more interesting group of actresses coming up. Um, you know, I think the, the pretty boyization of American movies has not actually been kind to young men in terms of giving them good developmental roles. Um, I think that Channing Tatum has managed to sort of break out of that is a, a, a good sign. I've, I've had him, a similar struggle, uh, you know, in the blogging world. So I, I feel his pain, you know, <laughs> Uh, and we've come really, really full circle. <laughs> well, uh, should we leave I think it it's there? good. I just want to thank you for having me on. I'm a big fan of what you do uh, and your show, and it's been a delight talking with you. Well, we'll have to do this again, maybe under happier circumstances. Yes, that would be nice. That would be nice. Thanks thank so you. much.